God's grace, His mercy, and His peace be with you through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Last week, if you recall, we looked at how to pray according to Jesus, and we looked at the Lord's Prayer. Today I'd like to look with you at the power of prayer, how to pray powerfully, and the need to persevere in it to the end according to Moses and Joshua. We're going to take a look today at the Old Testament event of the Battle of Rephidim and what we can learn through that great Old Testament story about not only praying with power, but also persevering in prayer till you see the final victory. Are you persevering in prayer today? Is it sort of difficult sometimes to continually stay steadfast in your prayers when you have not yet seen what you're asking for? Well, today, let's see what encouragements the Holy Spirit has for us through his people, Moses and Joshua, for our perseverance in prayer today, for our help and encouragement in Christ. First, let's just start and set the scene. So we're going to look at Exodus 17 today. We're going to be in, uh, starting in verse 8. We read there that, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So what is the scene here is Israel has just escaped the hand of Pharaoh. They've been rescued with God's almighty outstretched hand. They've left Egypt, and they're not yet to Mount Sinai, and the receiving of the Ten Commandments was really the first thing they did. But on the way there, they meet Amalek and his army coming against them to battle. Who is Amalek? Well, Amalek is the grandson, basically, of Esau. And so this is an ancient foe for Israel. Not that they were fighting with Israel previously, but Jacob and Esau, remember, were at war with each other. Even from their mother's womb, they struggled in the womb and fought each other. And they warred and fought in their lives. So Amalek are kind of like the slightly distant relatives and kinsfolk of the people of Israel. But they are now dwelling in that Arabian Peninsula area as a nomadic tribe, and they were known in the ancient Amarna tablets as part of the general name Kabati, which means plunderers. So this is a warring nomadic tribe living between the Dead Sea and the Red Sea. Descendants, uh, these descendants of Amalek, now they'd come against Israel fresh out of Egypt to war against them and to plunder them. And so let's take, pick up and read what happens. Exodus 17. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose for us men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. And uh, Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the mountain, up to the top of the hill. When Moses, whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, but whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat upon it. And Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on the one side and one on the other. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua mowed down Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. What a great story. What a great story. So what do we learn here, though, about prayer, about the power of it, and about persevering in prayer until we see final victory? First thing I think we can learn here, pretty obvious teaching, is that life as a Christian is a battle. As soon as you get rid of one enemy, then next one appears. Don't you feel like life is like that? I mean, we want life sometimes to be just cake and ale and raisins and everything just nice and... You know, it should be smooth, but for the Christian, it's from one battle to the next. They just got rid of Pharaoh in Egypt, their great enemy, and now they just get out, and now another one comes against them, Amalek, with his plundering nomadic tribe army against them to destroy them. And so we too, life as a Christian is a continual battle or a series of battles. Don't you feel that way? Do you have something... You're battling today. We fight sometimes against people or persons or situations or circumstances or just the troubles we face 
or especially evil spirits, or especially the devil, because we're not contending, says Paul, against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, world rulers of this present darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. That's why we need to take the whole armor of God, like Joshua, to go out and fight to win. So life is a battle. Say that with me. Life is a battle. If you're facing a battle today, hey, welcome to the Christian life. So that's part number one. But number two, when you go out to battle against an enemy, whatever it be, a trouble or an evil spirit or whatever, what do you need to fight? What did Joshua take with him? Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men, go out and fight with Amalek. Do you think we went out barehanded? No, he brought with himself a sword. And so we need a sword, right? Of course, you know I love my swords. I have them here again today. So the sword, this is the Roman gladius, the sharp two-edged sword. What is our sharp two-edged sword, O oh Joshua, that you need to go out and fight your battles with? The word of God, right? We, need, we, go, we go out and actually wrestle and contend with evil spirits with this sword. And there is no sword like it in all the earth because it never returns empty. It accomplishes what it purposes and prospers in the things for which God sends it. And so a great army has a great sword. It's the sword of the word of God. The word of God, the sword. You can't win without it. But what we also learn, thirdly, from this passage is as great as this sword is, and it never fails, you can't win the battle only with that sword. You need a second sword with you, which in a sense is even greater, though nothing's greater than the word of God. But let's read about that. Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him, fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, Hur went up to the top of the hill. When Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. So that's a second sword, wouldn't you say? A second sword. It's, yes, I love these. And in a sense, though not really, but in a sense, it is even greater. Because if you only go onto the field of battle with the word of God, as great as that is, and you don't also ascend the hill, like Moses, with prayer, what happened to Joshua in the valley? He was defeated and pushed back by Amalek. But when Moses was on the hill with the greater sword, that, that of prayer, holding up his hands, Amalek, I'm uh, sorry, Joshua in the valley prevailed and Amalek lost ground and was pushed back. So when we go into battle, we need both swords. I'm a little scary, I'll push them this way. So we need both of these. You need the word of God to fight and roll up your sleeves and just duke it out and get in there and fight with the word. Use it against whatever you're facing. But we must not neglect also to ascend the mount to go up onto the hill in prayer. Because if you don't go up on the hill and pray, what happens in the valley? It's the victory on the hill that assures the, the proper going of the battle in the valley. But if you don't go onto the hill and ascend there and lift up your hands to prayer and prayer and power, then in the valley, Joshua was pushed back. We often forget this, don't we? Which is easier? To go into the fight and, uh, and brandish your sword and, and sweat and, and slug it out or to go up under the hill and pray. It's actually a lot of times easier for us just to roll up our sleeves and handle whatever problem we have and, and grapple with it and fight with it than it is to go up on to the hill of prayer as well. And so prayer in that sense is a greater sword. It is what gives us the victory in the valley. If you think of that, the same thing in war, right? All wars are fought this way. If you, in the old England days, you uh, build your castle on the mount, in, an in a defensible fortress on the heights, and then nobody can attack you or beat you in the valley because you hold the hill, the highest place. Same thing in the days of Napoleon. The French, when they tried to take over the world, well, whoever had the highest place, they had hot air balloons then, you'd send them up and scout the enemy's movements below, whoever had the highest place, there won. 
Same thing in World War II. When the Luftwaffe controlled the skies over Europe, we couldn't move forward. When we defeated them with our own Air Force, the U.S. Army Air Corps held the skies over Europe, then Patton can move forward on the ground, move in and defeat Hitler. Same thing with us. We do need to roll up our sleeves with the Word of God and engage and fight. But we have to ascend the hill and gain the skies if we will get the victory. Amen? So we need both swords. The prayer of a righteous man has great power in its effects. We need to pray to win the day. But next point is we often fail at this, don't we? What happens is, well, let's read it. Moses, whenever Mo Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. Whenever he lowered his hand, Amalek prevailed. Verse 12, but Moses' hands grew weary. Isn't that the way with our prayers? It can be tiring. It's a very difficult task. Uh, not easy to do. To hold up our hands for long, they begin to fall. Moses' hands grew weary. Note something here kind of interesting. Does Joshua get tired on the field? No, no, there's no inclination or no, no in, uh, intimation in the word that Joshua ever got tired because it's easier to roll up your sleeves and duke it out and you're sweating and you're engaged with your trouble, whatever it is, but it's harder to go up onto the hill to pray. It's Moses who got tired because the greater the spiritual task, the harder it is to keep your hands up. And so we see that here with Moses. And why can we become discouraged and fail in prayer on the mount? Not only because it's hard, but because a lot of times what happens is we pray for something that we want to see the victory in at once, and we don't see the victory at once. Do you find like that happens with you? Have you been praying for something for, like, say, a really long time, and you still haven't seen victory? What happens? You can get discouraged, and you can start to droop your hands, and you become weary of praying for this, because I'm just not seeing the victory that I was looking for here. But what do we learn here about prayer in this passage? Is really that prayer is effective in the valley when it's prayed on the mount, but you shouldn't expect victory all at once. He's up there, Moses is, praying on the mount, and yet the battle is still raging. They don't get the victory in the valley. He's up there praying, and whenever he holds up his hands, though, what is happening? Joshua is getting strengthened, and he's pushing back and weakening Amalek, who's losing ground. Joshua's taking ground. He hasn't won the victory, he's taking ground. Whenever he lowers his hands, Joshua gets weak, Amalek gets strong, and Joshua loses ground, and he's pushed back. My point there is, or the point here in Scripture, is that when you're praying, and it seems a long time, and you haven't seen the victory at once that you're seeking, don't give up. Never give up. It is having its effect in the valley. It's pushing your enemy back and strengthening you. And we need to do it. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up until you have final victory at the day's end. You know, I think, uh, for example, um, Beth, you know, we've been praying for you, Beth, for a long time. I have my whole life, and, and we have a great marriage, and we have great joys. But, you know, we wrestle with a lot of things. You guys know that. Now, we've been praying for all these years, and she's been wrestling with things for, what, 40 years or so? Have these prayers been effective when we go up on the hill and raise the sword up there? Well, we haven't seen total victory yet. Should we then droop our hands and say, well, I guess it ain't doing no good. Or I guess we'll just give up on it. Or have these prayers over the years, God help and heal her, been driving back the enemy, weakening him and strengthening her. Man, we've seen you, Beth, delivered on occasion after occasion. And we have a great marriage and we're joyful, and we're still in the faith, and we're strong. Where would we be if we'd not ascended the hill in prayer? Probably dead. I mean, who knows? I mean, I would be, that is, we'd be lost in the faith, or harmed in our bodies, were we not praying. 
They're having effects. Your prayers are having effect, even if you don't have yet see the victory that you're seeking. You know, we often pray thinking, well, if I prayed once, then I should just have total victory, because that's faith, right? It's just, defeat the foe in an instant. Well, we, we read there a moment ago, Elijah was on the hill, and he was praying seven times, and then comes the great storm of rain. You know, he, it, it took seven times. It takes us times. Jesus had to defeat the devil in the wilderness three times before the devil left. Don't give up. Never give up. Your prayers are effective, is the point. But we often do get discouraged. It's not easy. As Jesus said to the disciples, Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And they were dropping their hands and drooping into sleep when it was time for fight and victory on the hill, on the mount, with prayer, Jesus said. So, it's not easy. We look for victory in the valley, but are we ascending the hill to pray? But it's hard, so what do we need? Now, this is a very clear, crystal, simple point from Scripture, but powerful. What do we need? What did Moses need? But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat upon it, and Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on the one side and the other on the other side. So his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. What do we need to hold up our hands, Kevin? Each other. We need friends. We need brothers. In fact, in this case, who is Aaron? Aaron is the brother of Moses. Who is her? You might not know him as much. That was the husband of Miriam, Moses' older sister. So it's brother and brother-in-law. Two brothers who are there as brothers to hold up his hands that it would stay steady to the end of the day and they get the victory, Joshua down in the valley. So we need perseverance if we're going to win the final victory. We need friends. And it's good to pray alone. Jesus tells us to go into wilderness and pray and pray to your Father who's in secret and such things. But we also need each other. For wherever two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of them, says Jesus. And wherever on earth two of you agree about anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. So I want to ask, who are your friends? Do you have people that are encouraging you in prayer and praying with you? On Tuesdays, I know Peggy, Lynn, and Jewel gather for prayer and through the week encourage each other that their hands not grow weary and they get stronger by it. I have uh, Pastor Roland up there in Georgia and Pastor Bruce in Titusville. We talk and encourage each other in prayer as well as Beth and Art and Ian and the rest of you encouraging me. I'm hopefully encouraging you here as a her or a, I'm not a her, like a they and a them and all this stuff, but H-U-R, a brother, or like Aaron, I'm encouraging you, lift up your hands today. And uh, Peter had James and John, and quite a threesome that was. For though a man might prevail against one who is alone, says Ecclesiastes, two will withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So, find some friends. If you don't have any friends, talk with me. We'll help you find some friends. I'll help you find some friends. We need to encourage each other is the point. For when we're together, we are strong. And that's just part of it. That's the way God's arranged it. That's the way it works. To endure in prayer, we need friends. And so we read Moses' hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Which leads to another next point of this. Where were Moses' hands again? What did they need to be? Lifted up. Oh my goodness, Lutherans. Lifting your hands? Are you kidding me? Does that mean you actually really literally have to lift your hands? It doesn't mean you literally have to. It's figurative in a sense, or teaching a lesson, principle, that we pray always. But at the same time, it is a biblical precedent to lift your hands in prayer. At times, it's a good thing. You can lift your eyes to heaven like Jesus did, or cast them down in deference to the majesty above. Those are good things. You can uh, fall down before the Lord. You can leap for joy. The point is, get your body into it. Jesus uh, does that, the rest of the apostles do, and here Moses, is, when he lifts his, lifts his hands up, 
physically. I desire that in every place, says Paul, the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. And so we did that last week. I would encourage you, put your bodies into it. Because when you put your bodies into your prayer, this is kind of a side note, but it encourages your prayer and helps you to persevere in it. I mean, when you just pray words, right? It's like, oh God, please heal Beth. You just fall asleep. It's just words. I mean, it's powerful, even so. But if I fall down before the Lord, or if I raise my hands, or if I lift my voice, or something I've done recently, amazingly, Beth has had a bronchitis type of uh, bronchial infection, and we went to the doctors and eventually ran out of medicines, and she was cast off. There's nothing left medical was going to do, and she's still coughing, and is getting weaker. And I was praying, and I wasn't seeing the results in the valley. And so I'm just like, okay, here, I'm going to do a little differently. I'm going to start, instead of just using words, I'm going to put pictures. I'm going to spend time just drawing a picture of Beth breathing clear and seeing her breathing free and feeling joyful and taking deep, awesome breaths. And I just took a time in my prayer to put that picture together and then handed that picture up to the Lord. It made prayer more fun, by the way. It made it easier to pray for longer, to put my heart into it. And lo and behold, like two days later, Beth's like, I'm breathing free. I'm breathing clear. This is great. And I'm like, Lord, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Not saying that's the way you have to do it, or like it's the secret to prayer or something, but I'm saying put your whole body into it. Lift your hands or do whatever you need to do. Form pictures. Spend time lifting up whatever you need to do to put your heart into it, your spirit into it, your mind into it, your whole body into it, lifting it up on the mount like that, you will begin to prevail in the valley. The next point is, notice, no, Moses, when he went up on that mount, he didn't go up there lifting his hands up like this, empty-handed. What did he have? I have so many props today. He lifted up the rod. He lifted up the rod, which is what? Authority. The power of God that was put into his hands. What, what rod do you have? You have a better rod, I tell you, than Moses ever had. His rod was powerful indeed, but yours is the authority of the Christian in the New Covenant. Behold, I've given you authority, Jesus says, to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, don't rejoice in that, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So can you go to God and say, I have authority which you've given to me as your son to win the, the victory in the valley, and I pray you're here on the hill with strength. Jesus says, ask, it will be given you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be open to you. God's promised to you, he'll answer you. He's commanded you to come. Ask greatly and believe. That's the authority. Lift up that rod. A second rod we lift up to him is his word. So we fight with the word in the valley, but fight with it on the hill too. Lift up the word of God to, to God and say, God, Hey, look, I am feeling weak today. I'm feeling scared. I'm feeling disheveled. I'm feeling discouraged. I'm feeling frightened about what's facing me, whatever it may be. Say, but you, God, I lift up this rod to you of the word, and I say, you've told me in your word that you have not given me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Therefore, Lord, knowing that's the truth of your word, so let it be. Let your word be done. Do you think God likes that kind of prayer? God's like, that is my favorite kind of prayer. When you tell me to keep my word, because I love to keep my word, and you'll be blessed, and he will do it. But you've got to keep doing it and keep praying until you see your victory. And thirdly, take the rod of the cross in your hands. Because the wood that we lift up to God and by which we approach God is really his grace of Jesus Christ. We have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, says the author of Hebrews. Therefore, draw near with a true heart and full assurance of, heart, of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. If you try to go to heaven to speak there with God on that mount, in your sins, you'll never make it. But if you go there and say, but I have confidence by the blood of Jesus, your son who died for me and rose again, in whom I've believed and been baptized, therefore I come with that authority, knowing that indeed what I ask shall be granted and the victory is on the way, even if I must pray until it comes. For if you then who are evil know how to give good tips to your children, 
How much more? Will the Heavenly Father give good things, good things to those who ask Him? Jesus says, so ask. Never give up. Are you giving up today? Don't give up. Keep it up. Keep praying. Keep going after it. Even if you haven't seen the victory yet, and we see that Moses' hands were steady until the going down of the sun, while the battle raged below. What was the result of that? Well, the result, verse 13, and Joshua mowed down Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So the word for mowed down in the, in the Hebrew is kalash, which means he overwhelmed them. He weakened his enemy. He made them frail, caused them to fall down, subdued them. I'll say beat them to smithereens, conquered them, and won the day. I like the Revised Standard Version has, here says, he mowed them down. Do you have any high grass that needs mowing today? To mow them down? What do you need to, do to mow down today? Have you been fighting in the field of battle even for a long time with no seeming success? Have you ascended the hill? Pray. The prayer of a righteous man has great power in its effects. And you keep praying. And you just keep believing. And keep your hope in God until your enemy, until your enemy is 100% defeated, namely to the going down of the sun. And indeed, you will get there because God gives you, gives to us the victory through prayer. So in conclusion, then you got to take both swords. Don't just fight with the word. That's the greatest. But go with the word. The sword of the prayer, too, that's, in a sense, even greater. The two together, no army, no enemy shall be able to stand before you. No trouble, but God will set you free and deliver you in time if you don't lose heart. So never give up. You will, in the end, win at the giving of the Lord of his victory to you. And the great final hope I'll just share with you is this, that in your battle, in our battle, we have Jesus, who is the greater Joshua, who has already gone into the field before you with his own sword, for the battle is the Lord's to give you the victory, to fight your battles for you, with you and for you. And he is our greater Moses on the lofty heights, always interceding for us in heaven. And he, I tell you the truth, never grows weary. His hands are raised up, up there for you in heaven, with authority and to you to keep you to the going down of the sun of this world and to the brightness of the world to come to final victory in jesus name amen